Hi, my name is Susanna Marcella, and I am the service chief of dermatology at the University of Florida. I graduated uh, 11 years ago from the University of Milano in Italy, and uh, after two years I moved to the United States, so I spent most of my professional uh, career in the United States. I've been asked to do a dermatology review, and um, I'm doing this with great pleasure. Since the topic is really extensive, I decided to limit it to small animals. So I will be talking about small animal dermatology for the whole length of this day. Here we go. I divided all the different diseases that I'm going to talk about in big categories. We will start with allergic skin diseases. Those are the most common ones that you will see in practice. Then uh, I'll talk about parasitic skin diseases, bacterial infections, fungal infections, autoimmune diseases or diseases that are immune mediated. Briefly talk about some neoplastic diseases and then endocrine and metabolic diseases. Dermatology is a big part of private practice. No matter where you will end up practicing, um, you will probably see between 20 and 80 percent of cases um, they have some kind of skin condition. And dermatology is definitely a big part of uh, the board exam. So I suggest you to study this closely. We will start with the most common allergy, which is atopic dermatitis. And then I will talk about food allergy, contact allergy, and flea allergy. Atopic dermatitis is something that uh, people get as well, and is actually a very common disease in kids. It is a genetically inherited disease, and that's true for both dogs and human beings. And it's an IgE-mediated disease, which means it's type 1 hypersensitivity is an immediate reaction. So if, uh, the best way to think about it is if you get an insect bite and you have a reaction, you will have an immediate reaction at 10, 15 minutes after the bite. You might get a later reaction at six hours and maybe one the following day. But the one that you get at 10, 15 minutes is the IgE mediated response, which is an immediate reaction. And that's the one that is important in atopic dermatitis. As far as typical age of onset, these are young animals. They're usually between one and three years of age. And that's true if they live all their life in the same environment. So I practice in Florida, and the typical Florida dog will come with clinical signs between one and three years of age. Some dogs are really bad, and they may develop clinical signs at less than one year of age. They may start as young as six months of age, like Sharpays or uh, Bulldogs. But the vast majority of dogs is between one and three years of age. It's a different story if you have an animal that moves from one geographical area to the other. In that case, let's say you have a dog that lived in Nebraska. Montana, I mean, some kind of cold climate, and then they move to Florida. They might be 10 at the time that they move to Florida, and the first season is not that bad, but then, you know, as they spend more time in a warm climate, they will develop clinical signs. So initially, they're seasonal. They might be bad in spring and summer, and then as the weather gets colder, they get better. Um, as far as Warm climates are concerned. Most of the ones that we see, they tend to become all year round fairly quickly. If you will end up practicing in an area that is fairly cold, you may still have a seasonality. The main difference between allergies in, uh, between dogs and people is that dogs tend to get worse with age, while people usually tend to get better with, with age. So allergies are really bad in kids. And then as you get older, the symptoms um, decrease. As far as clinical signs, is the, the main one is itching, pruritus. And then you can have erythema, which is redness. So at the very beginning, um, you will have an itchy dog, and it's usually face, feet, and ears. And um, when you look at the skin, you will not see anything. But the dog is itchy, and so he's spending a lot of time rubbing the face against the carpet and the furniture, um, licking and chewing the feet, and then scratching the ears. 
and as a consequence of that, they will get recurrent skin and ear infections. And there are mainly two types of infections. They can either be bacterial or they can be yeast, sometimes a combination of both bacteria and yeast. I have here some pictures for you. This is a Bassetown, which is a commonly um, affected breed. And uh, you can see this dog has done some kind of uh, uh, face rubbing. You have a bit of periocular alopecia, a bit on the face. Definitely he has pruritus on his legs. He has been uh, licking and chewing on his front feet. And then as he has gotten progressively worse, he's doing all four feet. So they usually start with the front feet first. And now he is developing also a secondary infection. And just looking at this dog, it looks like both bacterial and yeast infection. There's another dog here. And this dog has what we call salivary staining, which is that kind of uh, discoloration of the hair and the skin. Um, this is very um, easily seen in dogs that have white feet. And you will see that rusty color, um, kind of a reddish discoloration. It tells you the dog has been licking and uh, uh, chewing on its feet. And then they get secondary yeast infection like this dog probably has. This is another dog. And uh, this is actually very obvious. You, you have uh, periocular alopecia. So this dog has been rubbing his face. And so the, the hair loss comes from the rubbing. And the erythema is just primary, so it's primary redness due to the underlying disease process. And like golden retrievers, they're prone uh, to get allergies, so it's a very common breed for that. So how do you make a diagnosis of atopic dermatitis? The most important thing is clinical signs and then exclusion of other pruritic diseases. There are other skin diseases that can look like atopic dermatitis. For example, food allergy looks exactly the same. You have face, feet, ears, they have pruritus, they have secondary skin infection. And just by looking at the dog, you cannot tell them apart. So it's very important that you rule out other pruritic skin diseases. And as I talk about food allergy, I will explain to you how to rule out food allergy before you can consider diagnosis of atopic dermatitis, especially if the pruritus is all year long and you don't have a good history. If you have a history of seasonal pruritus at the beginning that got progressively worse, then you can make a diagnosis of atopic dermatitis right from the start. There are some testing that you can do, but usually people put too much emphasis on this test. And you can do skin testing, which is what specialists usually do, because the allergens are expensive and they expire uh, rapidly, so it's not something that you will be doing in practice. Serology testing is more easily available. You draw some blood, you submit it, and you're basically looking for circulating IgE. The drawback of this testing is that you can have false positive results in normal individuals. So, for example, I can have a dog with scabies, and I do skin testing, or I do serology testing, and they come out positive. That does not make that animal atopic. The only thing that it tells me is that that animal has IgE against whatever allergen I'm testing it for, but by itself, is not sufficient to make a clinical diagnosis of atopic dermatitis. So you should not, never put too much emphasis on your testing. You should look at the dog, consider the history, and make sure that you are ruling out other pruritic skin diseases. Now, what about therapy? One important thing to remember in dermatology is the threshold phenomena, which means that in dermatology, you usually have several diseases going on in the same animal. Uh, for example, it's not unusual to have multiple allergies in the same animal because allergies are a genetic predisposition. So an animal that has atopic dermatitis has higher risk of developing flea allergy, food allergy, and other allergies. On top of that, they get secondary skin infection, and so everything adds up. So 
a bit of bacteria, a bit of yeast will make that animal more itchy and will add on the underlying allergy. So when you have an allergic animal, the first thing that you should do is, number one, make sure that it doesn't have a secondary infection. And if it does it, then you have to address it. And then see whatever is the pruritus that is left. And then see if it has flea allergy. If it does, you have to control the fleas. Make sure you're not missing a food allergy. And then you're left with the atopic dermatitis. And as far as treatments, you can, there is a list of symptomatic treatments. The most commonly used is steroids. I strongly recommend only oral steroids because it's something that you can regulate more um, readily. So if the animal has any kind of side effect, you can stop it. And also, you have less adrenal suppression. If you give an injection, you may have prolonged adrenal suppression even for months, especially if it's a repository formulation. The problem with steroids is that they work very well at the beginning, and over time, they stop working. So you're left with other treatments, which are usually not as powerful as steroids. That's why steroids should be used in a very um, limited way, and you should explore other alternatives. The other thing that steroids do, is they make infections more likely to reoccur and resistant to treatment. So I always um, discourage people from using steroids and, antihistin and antibiotics at the same time. Then you can use antihistamines. Antihistamines, there is a, a long list of different antihistamines that you can try. They belong to different categories, and different dogs may respond in a different way. So you can use Benadryl, you can use Atarax, you can use Clotrimethone. And what I usually do, I go through the whole trial. I try each one for two weeks and see how the dog does. If there is no response, then I switch to the next one. As a general rule, antihistamines are metabolized more quickly in dogs, so we tend to use dosages that are much higher than what people would normally use. To give you an example, if you use Benadryl, people use 25, 50 milligrams of Benadryl as a sleeping pill. Well, in dogs, the dose is one milligram per pound. So if you have three times a day, so if you have a 50-pound dog, you can give him a 50-milligram Benadryl three times a day, which basically would put all of us to sleep for a long time. So dogs tend to metabolize antihistamines more readily. Then you can combine them with essential fatty acids. There is a variety of fatty acids that you can try. And then if the animal has a long season, then we try hyposensitization which is basically allergy vaccine like they do in people. Once you have the results of your skin testing or serology testing, you pick the allergens that you think are clinically relevant for that animal, and you make up the vaccine. The success rate of hyposensitization is between 70 and 80 percent in dogs, especially if you start in young animals, but it takes time, between six and nine months before you can really see the full improvement. And most of these dogs will require hyposensitization for the rest of their lives. Then there are some new treatments. And I don't know, somebody might ask you questions about that. Uh, we have been uh, using cyclosporin now for about a year. Uh, we use a dose that is lower than the immunosuppressive dose. And so immunosuppressive, you would use like a 20 milligram per kilogram. And as far as um, those for atopic dermatitis, we use 5 milligram per kilogram. Uh, cyclosporine is a strong immunomodulating slash immunosuppressive agent. Um, so there is a potential for problems. At the lower dose, we have never had problems, but you probably want to check CBC and chemistry on a routine basis if you have patients on this medication. And then misoprostol, uh, Cytotec is another drug that has shown to have some kind of anti-allergic property. 
by itself is not strong enough and you have to combine it with something else, possibly antihistamines. And then pentoxifiline. Pentoxifiline is a drug that has been on the market for a long time for people and it works by suppressing tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-1, and interleukin-6. And those are all pro-inflammatory cytokines. So it has anti-inflammatory um, and anti-allergic properties. So if you use a 15, 20 milligram per kilogram twice, three times a day, it's a fairly good anti-inflammatory medication. You may use it by itself or in conjunction with antihistamines. Now we're done with atopic dermatitis. We're moving to food allergy. Food allergy is not nearly as common as people uh, may think. There's been a lot of pressure, um, uh, especially from companies producing dog foods uh, to uh, make it sound like it's such a common allergy, but in reality it's not. So if you see a hundred itchy dogs, 95% um, of them have atopic dermatitis and only 5% of them have food allergy. But it's something that you should rule out, especially if the history is not clear and you have non-seasonal symptoms. Um, it can start at any age, and that's the main difference between atopic dermatitis and food allergy. When we talked about atopic dermatitis, we said it's usually between one and three years of age. So if I have a really young animal, or a really old animal, I should probably put food allergy higher on my list of differential. Um, so the other thing, um, you don't need to change the diet in order to have a food allergy. Actually, 70% of dogs with food allergy have been fed the same diet for over two years, which makes sense. It means that it takes time for an animal to build a hypersensitivity. But people don't realize that. So when you talk about food allergy as a possibility, the most common thing that people say is that I've been feeding this diet for a long time, so it cannot be food allergy, and that's wrong. It's usually a pruritic disease. It can look like atopic dermatitis, so you have itchy face, itchy feet, itchy ears. Recurrent skin and ear infections, exactly like um, atopic dermatitis. The main difference is with food allergy, you may have perineal pruritus, means uh, tail, back legs, and all the perineal area. So we say ears and rears. Um, and that's different from atopic dermatitis. So it's more the area where flea allergic animals are itchy. Here are some pictures. This is a dog that was diagnosed with food allergy, and once again, you can see that the animal has some periocular uh, pruritus and uh, has been grubbing. So you have alopecia, you have alopecia on the muzzle, and this dog had also ear infection. This was a dog obviously very itchy, was itchy on his feet, had been traumatizing his feet, and uh, I don't know if you can appreciate that, but you, there is a rusty discoloration in the nails. So these nails are supposed to be white, and they have that kind of rusty uh, reddish color. And that is a symptom of malassezia, infection of the nail bed. So malassezia is a yeast we'll talk about in a minute, and that's very common in dogs with allergies. So how do you make a diagnosis of food allergy? You have to do a food trial. There are tests on the market. Um, you can do serology testing, and some people do skin testing for food allergy, but the truth is that they don't work. When they've done studies and they looked at the positive predictive value, which means what are the chances uh, that the animal is truly um, allergic to beef if you have a positive serology to beef, the positive predictive value was less than 50%. It's almost like saying if I have a positive serology for beef, it's actually unlikely that the animal will have a clinical allergy for beef. So now we do food trial, which means that you have to select something, that um, a source of protein and a source of carbohydrate that is brand new for that dog. So over the years, we have been looking for unusual types of meats, 
And that's why now we have, in the United States, we have venison diet, we have a rabbit and potato diet, uh, we have um, kangaroo uh, and oats. Um, we have all kinds of bizarre diets, and that's why we're looking for something that the animal has never been exposed to before. Um, and then feed that diet with no treats, no snacks, nothing else for two months. So it's not sufficient just to do a diet switch. Sometimes people just change from one brand to the other, and that really doesn't help because a lot of ingredients are in common. And there are only a few brands that you can use for a food trial. Um, it has to be a clean diet. A lot of diets, they say, is lemon rice and then you read on the label and there's all kinds of ingredients. So in the United States, the clean uh, diets are IVD, which is Innovative Veterinary Diet, Nature Recipe. Uh, Waltham has some uh, good diet, um, Science Diet. I mean, there are some from Hills that um, you can use. And now uh, we have had hydrolyzed diet in the uh, last year or six months, and I'll cover those in a, in a minute. So when you do the food trial, basically what you're monitoring is the pruritus, which is the itching, and the recurrence of infection. So it's very important for you to know how uh, often that animal tends to get, I don't know, a year infection. So you have to get that from your history. So let's say this dog gets a um, skin infection once a month. And so what you're trying to do is to see if I cleared infection and then I changed the diet, can I make this, um, can I make him go two months, three months, four months without any infection? So that's the key. And then let's say that for three months this animal has no infections, but you've also been doing other things. You've been doing flea control, you've been very good with bathing and everything else. How do I know that this dog truly has a food allergy? And the key is that you have to go back and re-challenge him and see if he has any worsening of clinical signs. Okay, so it's not enough that you just change the diet. That animal might have inhaling allergy and it's just going out of season. It's winter time, so it looks like everything is great and everybody's saying it's food allergy. You have to go back and be challenged. And then just a few words on hydrolyzed diets because you might be asked about it. There are several ones that uh, we have here on the market in the States. Um, one is, the, the most recent is VD, which is hydrolyzed chicken, but there are several other ones on the market. And basically the theory behind the hydrolyzed diet is that if I make the protein uh, very small, um, that molecule is so small that it cannot um, cross bridge um, two IgE molecules on the mast cells, therefore cannot trigger mast cell degranulation. So remember, we're still looking at mostly type 1 hypersensitivity, which is IgE mediated. And the idea behind that is that if you produce IgE and this IgE bind on the mast cell, upon the exposure to the same allergen, the allergen binds to the IgE. And if you have cross-linking of two molecules, that's sufficient to trigger mast cell degranulation. Now, if the molecule is small enough, it cannot uh, link to IgE, therefore you have no symptoms. So that's the theory. The problem is that a lot of these proteins, let's say you hydrolyze the molecule, but once you put it in the bag, these molecules tend to re-aggregate with each other. Therefore, the size does not always stay as small as it is supposed to be. That's why we don't recommend hydrolyzed diet for diagnostic purposes when you don't know if the animal has a food allergy or not. Once you have your diagnosis, you can try those diets to see if you can control an animal on that specific diet. But I've had several animals that were diagnosed with a certain food allergy, for example, chicken, and uh, then you put on a hydrolyzed chicken diet and they flared up. So obviously, something went wrong. So I wouldn't recommend you to use these dice, but they're on the market. You may be uh, asked questions on it, and I explained to you what's the rationale uh, behind this diet. And the, the hydrolyzed dice are kind of commonly used in infants with milk allergies, and that's where the idea comes from. 
So therapy for food allergy is avoidance. Uh, you could try to use steroids, but a lot of dogs do not respond to steroids, so definitely it's an allergy that you need to diagnose and uh, um, just avoid whatever offending food is responsible. Since it's a genetic thing, you may have animals that over time develop more and more uh, food allergies. Contact allergy is a type 4, which is cell-mediated, is delayed, mean it's like poison ivy in the woods and it takes one or two days before you have clinical signs. And it's an itchy disease, extremely itchy, and it is a popular disease, which means you have red bumps. And then you get secondary infections, and you diagnose it by doing either confinement or doing a touch test. Confinement means that I wash the dog and confine him in a cage for a week, ten days, and then all the symptoms go away. If that had been an inhaling allergy, the animal will still have clinical signs. But since I'm preventing contact with whatever offending plane or a carpet or whatever substance is, the animal will get better. Or I can do a patch test, which means I physically apply a sample of carpet fiber or plant on the skin, put a bandage on, wait 24 hours, remove it, and look for a reaction. I have here some pictures, some showed up okay and other ones didn't, so I'll try my best. Here you see this little red dots, little papules, and this dog had it all over on his arms and underneath his belly, and so he had a contact allergy to carpet. And that's the same dog and had a bit of a papular eruption here on, on the ear, had it here on his face around his eyes, on his neck, it was intensely pruritic. And uh, this one is probably the one that shut up best. You have this tiny little papules, red dots, very, very itchy. So that was all contact allergy. The same on the foot. And you can appreciate, uh, it was obviously redness, and the dog was very itchy, and then you have these tiny papules. And so that is something that is very typical of contact allergy. Therapy, again, uh, avoidance would be the best thing. You can try to use steroids, and they usually work, at least initially. Or you can try pentoxithalin. And pentoxithalin is what they use in people, uh, say people with poison ivy. You know you're going to be in the woods. You start pentoxithalin treatment two days before you go out and so it has a protective effect. Now, antihistamines would not work because contact is type 4, hypersensitivity, which is cell-mediated, while the antihistamines work for type 1, which is IgE-mediated. So there are different types of diseases, and that's why for atopic dermatitis we use antihistamines. For contact allergy, we cannot use antihistamines. Steroids would work for both. And then flea allergy, very, very common. The, the pathogenesis is a combination of hypersensitivity, both immediate, which is type 1, and delayed, type 4. As an itchy disease, you have papules. You can have hot spots, very common. Um, the proper term is pyotraumatic dermatitis. And the distribution is rump, legs, back tail, uh, um, back legs and tail. Um, diagnosis, you make it by clinical science, and you can do interdermal skin testing. And therapy should be mainly avoidance, which means free control, and you can use steroids as an adjunctive treatment. I have here some pictures, I mean, just to show you the distribution. I mean, this dog is clearly brown and had tail, so it had nothing else in the front of his body. Very itchy. This one had a hot spot. And so you clip it, you clean it, and then you realize how extensive the lesion is. That's very, very pruritic. I have some information on flea controls just to give you an idea what's on the market. Uh, somebody might ask you. There are things that you can use on pets, and you can use the adulticides, which is what most commonly people are doing now. Uh, you can combine with insect growth regulators, or you can use chitin inhibitors. 
just as a general thing about fleas, um, a few facts to remember. Um, most of the adult fleas, you find it on the host. But if I find five adult fleas on one dog, it means that I have at least 1,000 immature stages in the environment. So the flea control should be uh, devoted not just to kill the adult fleas on the animal, but also to get rid of the immature forms, which means eggs, larvae, and um, cocoon in the environment. And then uh, hatching is triggered by vibrations, uh, which means that if you go in the house and it's been empty for a while and you start work, uh, walking on the carpet, you have all these young adults and they will all emerge and they will be looking for a blood meal. And that's why the place that might have been empty for a long time and nobody lived there, no animals, and then suddenly you have a flea infestation. They do not survive direct UV light, so if you have an uh, extensive air to treat, let's say outside environment, only focus on the areas that are shaded areas, where there are trees and there is no direct uh, light penetration. And then the ideal temperature, 65, 75 um, Fahrenheit. Several products that we have currently in the United States available to kill adult fleas. The popular uh, front line, it comes as a spray or as drops that you apply on the animal. You can use Advantage, it's also an adulticide. They're both monthly products. The difference between um, Advantage and Frontline, Advantage only kills fleas. Um, Frontline kills fleas and ticks. Advantage is rapidly washed off, um, and frontline tends to stay on the coat after a bath. But you have to, um, when you, if you use frontline, let's say you give a bath today, then you have to wait 24, 48 hours before you apply frontline. And once you apply frontline, then you have to wait another 24, 48 hours before you can give another bath. And that's to allow enough penetration of the product on the, um, in the sebaceous glands. And then you have revolution, which is hormone prevention, flea control, kills mice. Um, for fleas, it's not a great product. Um, I guess it's about 80% effective, so it's general flea control is, is okay. If you have a flea allergic animal, you need to use something stronger. And then castor is a pill that you give, and it kills fleas within 30 minutes. Uh, and uh, But it doesn't have a residual activity, so you should basically give it daily, which does not, is not a very effective treatment long term, and um, is not the best thing for flea allergic animals, because the flea has to bite the dog to get the medication so that they can die. So, um, so if you have a flea allergic animal, that animal is going to be itchy even after the flea dies just because they are allergic to the flea saliva. And then you have pyrethrins, permethrin, a lot of products that are a combination of both. Um, permethrin, uh, if you use high enough concentration, is a repellent. At 2% is a repellent. Um, it's very safe for dogs. It's toxic for cats. And then you have IGR, which are insect growth regulators. Uh, so they don't kill the flea, but they prevent them from reproducing. You can have the methoprim is the oldest one, and is, is an okay product, but it's inactivated by UV light. So if I have a collar that has methoprim and the animal goes outside, uh, it's inactivated. So it, it doesn't have much use. Or you can use the newest one is Pyritroxis and Nylar, which you can find in collars or you can find in a spray, and it's resistant to UV light and it lasts for a long time, four months. You can use chitin inhibitors like program, and uh, is, a, is a very good thing to use, and I do recommend to alternate products and or to combine program with an adulticide just because we are seeing more and more resistance. And the only limitation with program is, number one, there is a lag phase. 
uh, before you see the improvement. So if I start a program today, it's going to take probably three months before I have a flea free environment. The other problem is, again, the flea has to buy the dog to get the program, and then it will not be able to have, um, the, the eggs will not be able to hatch, which is too late for the flea allergic animal. And it works best in a confined environment. So if you take the dog for walks, then a uh, program is not the best flea control. And then you have products for the outside environment. You can use, again, um, IGR, like peroxicin, um, pyrethrin, permethrin, and then the beneficial nematodes, which are nematodes that actually kill fleas, something that is sold in granules. You mix it with water and you spray in the yard. The only limitation is the nematodes um, need to have a moist environment. So if there is not, uh, if there is a long period of drought, they will die. They don't reproduce, which means they have to reapply them, and they don't move very, very much. So you have to apply them exactly where you need them. And then for the inside in the house, you can use sodium polyborate. Um, or a combination of IGR, pyrethrin, and permethrin. Sodium polyborate is especially good for carpets. So there are companies that do this, and they apply directly in the carpet, and they guarantee it for a year. Freebuster is one company that does this. Let's move to parasitic skin diseases. We have only two. They're really important. One is hemodicosis, and the other one is scabies. Demodex, that is a big, important disease to know. Demodex is part of the normal flora, but there are some dogs in which there is an immunological defect which has not been cleared yet, and therefore these dogs are not able to keep the mite count under control, and they have the mites proliferating, and they develop skin lesions and disease. Um, there are a few things to know about Demodex. One is the life cycle is three weeks which means that uh, if you have eggs on the skin scraping today, then you're going to have mice for at least three weeks after that. And there are four different life stages, and uh, you may be asked to recognize the different life stages, so you need to be familiar with how the eggs, the larvae, the nymphs, and the adults look like. The egg is easy, and I have a picture of that. The larva is also easy because it's the only one that has three pair of legs. And uh, uh, the nymph and the adult has four pair of legs. So if you start counting the legs, you should have no problem. As far as clinical um, syndromes, you can have the juvenile onset. And the juvenile onset can be uh, localized or can be generalized, or you can have the adult onset. And we say juvenile if the animal is less than uh, two years of age, adult onset if it's older than two years. The localized juvenile form is a benign form, so there is nothing genetically wrong with those animals. They just get stressed, and they develop patchy hair loss. It is usually one region on the body. It's usually on the face or on the feet, and 90% of them, they spontaneously resolve. They don't develop any further skin disease later on in their lives. And so these animals can be used for breeding. There is nothing wrong with them. However, 10% of them will progress into a generalized form, and that's a completely different disease. They, these animals have a genetically inherited disease. They should not be used for breeding, and they might still clear spontaneously, 50% of them, but even the ones that spontaneously clear, they still have the genetic defect um, and they will transmit this deficiency to their puppies, so they should not be used for breeding. Clinically, the hemodicosis um, shows up as a folliculitis, um, and then which means papules and pustules and epidermal colorets, and you may see comedones, which are blackheads, so you have like little black dots, and then secondary infection and the feet are commonly affected. So this is a picture to show you that gray discoloration 
that is very common with the mudicosis. So when you see that kind of grayish color, you should always scrape the dog. Even if you don't have hair loss, like in this case, the dog had demodex and it was not losing the hair, but already had this um, dip, uh, uh, change in pigmentation. This dog had deep pyoderma on his feet and had demodicosis. So if you have an animal with pododermatitis, demodicosis should be one of your first differentials. But I see a dog like this, I say, well, definitely has a deep infection. I see all the swelling. And then I say, well, demodex is one of the possibilities. The other possibility is that I have allergies, like uh, either therapy or food. Um, it could be a contact. It could be a, a fungal infection. But demodex should be one of your first differential diagnoses. And again, um, deep skin scraping is what you need to do to make a diagnosis. And this is an adult, has four pair of uh, legs. This is an egg. Uh, and that's as much as I can see on this slide. Now, if you have an adult dogs, then uh, it means that there is an underlying disease. So this is not a genetically inherited disease. It means that it has some other condition. So that is getting immunosuppressed and is developing pneumodicosis. So you have to look for an underlying tumor, um, either hypothyroidism or pushing or too many steroids or, you know, some other uh, condition. As far as treatment, the only FDA-approved treatment in the United States is Madabin. And the approved treatment is one dip every two weeks. Now, this is a legal treatment. However, they've done studies and it has been proven that if you use it once a week rather than once every two weeks, it works much better. But according to the law, you should use it once every two weeks. You should prepare it fresh every week. And as far as side effects, the most common is sedation. You may have other side effects, but sedation is the most common thing you'll see. And then there are other treatments that we use routinely, but they're not approved. Um, so you have ivermectin. The only legally approved use of ivermectin in the United States is harm prevention. But people use it for other things, and uh, Demodex is one of them. And we use a very high dose. 400 to 600 microgram per kilogram daily. To give you an idea, the hard one prevention dose is 6 microgram per kilogram once a month. So this is a much higher dose, and obviously you should not use it in collies or in breeds that are sensitive to ivermectin. The uh, toxic dose for collies is around 100 microgram per kilogram, so this is much higher. And then you have melbomycin, which is the same family of drugs, and is 1.5 to 2 milligram per kilogram once a day. And then you should use antibiotic because the pyoderma, which means a bacterial infection, is very common with hemodicosis. And you have to monitor the improvement. And we scrape these dogs once a month, and then we record the findings. And ideally, you should have three consecutive negative scrapings before you can discontinue treatment. The second parasitic disease we're going to talk about is scabies. Scabies is contagious, that's different from Demodex, which is not, and is a very itchy uh, disease and is a popular disease. The life cycle is like Demodex, three weeks. It's not host specific, which means that um, a dog can get scabies from people and uh, people can get scabies from dogs. So even if they have slightly different mites, we can kind of exchange mites. However, if I get scabies from a dog, that mite will not be able to reproduce on my skin. So I will get an itchy rash, but within uh, 10 to 14 days, the mite will die, and that will be the end of the story. Um, mites also do not survive for very long in the environment, so usually environmental control is not a big issue. And you have primarily a ventral distribution, ventral abdomen, pinna, hocks, and elbows. And this is just how it looks clinically. You have this popular eruption here on the ventral abdomen, and it's intensely pruritic. 
And this again, you can see the escoriation uh, due to the intense pruritus. Diagnosis, you can do the scraping and see if you find the mites. The problem is that most of the times the scrapings are negative because the, um, the dog becomes hypersensitive to the mites and so very few mites are sufficient to cause severe clinical signs. So most of the times the dog has two or three mites here on the whole body and the chances of you finding it with the scraping is very low. So we do response to treatment. And as far as treatment, you can do lime dip, which is something you find in the United States and you don't find in other countries. It's lime sulfur once a week for the, at least three, four times. You can use Revolution, which is approved for this use. Um, we have seen some failures, but it's legally approved. And then you have non-approved treatments. You can use Garamactin. And the dose we use for scabies is 250 to 300 micro, microgram per kilogram once uh, every two weeks for three times. Or you can use nobomycin. Frontline will also kill uh, scabies. Or you can use mitobin. So if you have a dog that has demodex and scabies, you can basically kill both of them just by using uh, Omnitrust, which is mitobin. It's important that all the animals in contact are treated and that you treat long enough to cover the whole life cycle. Let's talk about bacterial skin infections now. The most important is pyoderma, um, which is usually stuff related. It's usually secondary. And you can have a superficial infection or you can have a deep infection. So the superficial is what we call folliculitis and deep one is bronchiolosis or cellulitis. Now, if somebody asks you what are the three most common causes of folliculitis in the dog, you have definitely staphylococcus, then demodex, and dermatophytes. Those are the three important ones that you really need to know. Um, as far as clinical signs, so pyoderma is usually hair loss. You can have a popular postural eruption, and then you have epidermal cholerex and uh, hyperpigmentation. So this is how the pastel look like. Uh, you have the erythema all around it and um, uh, it's filled with this blister looking region is filled with pus. This is a macule. The pastel is very transient so it doesn't stay there very long. Uh, this dog has generalized uh, clinical signs of retinas and hair loss. And as far as treatment, okay, if you have a superficial infection, then you have to give the antibiotic for at least a month, three, four weeks. And then we also prescribe topical therapy, usually like benzoyl peroxide shampoo. And then you have to figure out the underlying cause. Why is this animal breaking with an infection? Because 99% of pyoderma is secondary to something else. Most commonly allergies, but it could be something different. And if you don't figure that out, that animal is going to relapse with infections over and over again. Then you can have a deep infection, and it's usually draining tracts like this Rottweiler. You have this deeper lesions and they're exudative, so you have material that comes out. Um, this one had demodex and deep pyoderma, so you can feel the lesions are deeper, they're draining, um, there's uh, redness. This one is on the foot. You can see these toes are swollen and they're draining, so it's a deep infection. This one is another one. It's rather dark, but um, hopefully you can still see has swollen toes and they're draining. This one is fairly uh, obvious. It's cellulitis. There's a deep infection has gone in the paniculus. This one was secondary to demodex. So um, if, if you have an animal like this, you have to do topical and systemic antibiotic. And it's usually for at least two months. Two months, sometimes six months, uh, depending. Like, for example, the dog I just showed you uh, that has cellulitis, easy, between four and six months. And you have to combine both the oral and the topical therapy. 
The problem when you have a deep infection is that you might have pseudomonas, and so you may have to uh, have a culture and sensitivity done to figure out what antibiotic you might need to use. And as far as antibiotics, is a, I, mean, I mean, there is no time to really go into details, but if you have a first occurrence pyoderma, which means that animal has never had an infection before, we tend to select something that is narrow spectrum. For example, erythromycin, lincomycin. The problem is that they, they get easily resistant to these antibiotics. But at the beginning, you want to have something that is selected for staphylococcus. You don't want to kill everything else. If you have a recurrent or a deep infection, then you tend to use something that is broad spectrum and the resistance is less likely to occur. So we tend to use things like cephalaxin, we use clavamox, we use fluoroquinolones like atro, um, arbofloxacin, there are all kinds of drugs in this category. Let's move to fungal infections now. You can have superficial, subcutaneous, or deep infections. Superficial, which is what I will be talking about today, is malassezia, which is a bit like pyoderma. It's a uh, secondary uh, infection that dogs get very frequently. And uh, dermatophytes, which is commonly called ringworm. And then the subcutaneous sporotrichosis is something you need to learn because it's a zoonotic disease, and so people can get it uh, very commonly from the exudate. If you have a little scratch or a wound on your um, fingers and you touch an animal that has spora, you will uh, develop the disease as well. And cats are really bad at um, transmitting that to people, but dogs can do it too. And then you have deep fungal infection. Uh, crypto is the one that um, I guess is probably the most... Um, commonly um, seen, and um, you will need to learn about these things as well, but since they're not strictly pertinent to dermatology, I will not cover them today. As far as malassezia, it's like staphylococcus. It's part of the normal flora, but it's supposed to be there in low number. However, if there is an underlying disease, the organism will in, uh, increase in number, and you will end up developing skin lesions. And uh, it's usually a very pretty disease, and then secondary to that, you will have alopecia, you will have redness and uh, bad smell. So when people complain about a rancid odor, like a seborrhea smell, that's usually the problem with malassezia. And you make a diagnosis by cytology. The different ways of doing cytology, you can do a swab, uh, you can use a tape, like a sticky tape, and then you just stain it. Um, you can do a dry scraping, which means that with a scalpel blade, just gently remove the material from the skin and then smear on the slide, hit fix it, and stain it. And we use this quick for that, which is like uh, very commonly available in the United States. And here is how malassezia looks on the slide. So uh, some are budding yeast and some are not. Um, so this is a budding yeast, so it has a peanut shape. This one is another one, and some are not like this one. And the um, ventral neck is a typical place where you will see malassezia, and um, copper spaniels are really bad with that. I mean, they tend to um, develop malassezia um, very commonly. And then West Island White Terrier, um, they tend to develop both pyoderma and malassezia. They become intensely pruritic and they basically live on antifungal medications like this one. So as far as treatment for malassezia, you have several options. You can use ketoconazole, nazarol, and uh, or you can use itraconazole. Um, itraconazole is more expensive. It comes in uh, capsules. Is safer overall than ketoconazole. Uh, fluconazole is also a very good drug. Um, it's even more expensive. The important thing is that you cannot use grisofulvin for malassezia. Okay? It just doesn't work. It's, uh, it's only for dermatophytes or uh, terbinafine. As far as topical therapy, you have salsum blue, which kills malassezia. In fact, when people have um, uh, danger on the scalp, that's the malassez infection, and that's why people use salsam blue. So you can use salsam blue in animals as well. 
uh, would be careful to use it on a cat, but you can definitely use it on a dog. Or you can use ketoconazole, which is nitrile shampoo, which is now available over the counter in the United States. But you can use myconazole, and there's several products. You can have a shampoo, you can use, have a conditioner, um, which is a leave-on product, resizol. As far as dermatophytes, which is ringworm, that's a zoonotic infection. And uh, dermatophytes have strong affinity for hair and nails, which means that um, if you get an uh, infection through arthrospores and you don't remove it right away, you have a high chance of having an infection. Um, and, uh, and again, the nail infection is probably the hardest disease to to get rid of both in humans and uh, uh, animals. The problem with the arthrospores is that they survive for a really long time, up to two years. So if you have an animal that has ringworm, um, it's going to take a lot of effort to get, uh, to get that environment completely clean. There's three dermatophytes that are important for dogs, and you definitely need to know the names. Um, Canis is the one that um, usually you get from cats, and gypsum you get it from the soil, and trichophyton you get it from rodents. And then predisposing factors, again, young animals are more predisposed, or if there is any kind of immunosuppressive disease or any trauma of the skin, they're uh, prone to develop dermatophytes. And is the folliculitis? So remember, we're covering all the different folliculitis, staphylococcus, demodex, dermatophytes. And so the clinical signs are similar. You have papules, pustules, epidermal colorets, and then uh, hair loss. And uh, if you have dermatophytes on the feet, um, it, you may develop onychogryphosis, which means long, distorted nails. And I have a few pictures of that. Or you can have a carrion, which is um, a nodular exudative lesions that dogs usually develop on the bridge of the nose. Now, this is a dog that has dermatophytosis on its face, and the lesions are um, rather extensive. You have hair loss, and you have this dog is itchy, has a secondary bacterial infection, and so you have a scoriation on its face. And this one is the more typical ringworm looking lesion. So you have just a round area of hair loss and the lesion will spread toward the periphery and then you'll have some hair growth uh, in the middle of the circle. And then this is uh, onychogryphosis, which means this long, ugly looking nails. Um, there is another dog here. Again, the snails, so they grow um, very fast and they are not normal looking. They break very easily. That's a sign of a fungal infection. How you diagnose it? You do a fungal culture and you use a special medium which is called DTM, which is their modified test medium. And it takes several weeks to grow and that uh, you have white colonies and uh, if you use a media that has a color indicator, the media becomes red. So you'll have a red plate with a white colony. Or you can take a biopsy and you will see arthrospores in the hair shaft, but you will not be able to know what kind of dermatophytes you have. Therapy, you have to do um, therapy on the host and in the environment. Uh, as far as the environment, um, vacuuming, uh, bleach it, um, is basically anything that can be possible bleached should be bleached. And the lowest uh, concentration of silk cell dermatophytes is 1 to 10. Inoconazole is uh, labeled in the United States for use in poultry, but um, people have used it in their house and it's very effective at killing arthrospores. And um, on the host, again, you have to do systemic and topical. Systemic, we have a list of drugs. Gusofolvin is included. And the treatment lasts for a long time. So one, two months, sometimes even longer than that. Okay, let's briefly go over these drugs. Gusofolvin is only for the modifieds. It does not kill any other fungal organism. 
is spongiostatic and has poor residual activity, which means if I stop resolving today, I have no benefit tomorrow. The drug is completely gone, and so I have no residual benefit. I need to give it food, and it should not be given to animals that are pregnant because it's parasitogenic. And the most common adverse effect is bone marrow suppression. So if I have an animal grisofolding, I should do a CBC, which is a complete blood count, on a routine basis. Or you can use ketoconazole, which is good for both the monocytes and monocytes and other fungal organisms. The main um, problem with ketoconazole is uh, liver toxicity. So you can have definitely GI upset, but you can have hepatitis. And the other thing is drug interaction because it suppresses an enzyme which is called cytochrome P450, and a lot of drugs need that enzyme to be metabolized. So if I give two drugs that depend on the same enzyme for metabolism, I, I will have decreased metabolism of the second drug. Um, I'll give you an example. If I combine uh, ketoconazole and uh, cyclosporin, ketoconazole suppresses P450, cyclosporin needs P450 to be metabolized, so I need to reduce the dose of cyclosporin, uh, otherwise I will have toxicity. Ketoconazole, same family as ketoconazole, um, some liver toxicity as well. You still have problems with drug interactions, but overall it's a safer drug and it has a stronger affinity for the skin, so I can do pulse therapy, which means I don't have to give it every day. I can give it three times a week. Terbinafine is a newer drug. It's, um, put on the, it's been put on the market for people with fungal infection of the nails. And the reason is because it stays in the nail and in the skin for a long time, up to two months after one dose. So you have prolonged residual activity. The good thing is that you don't have drug interaction, so you don't have to worry about that. The problem is that it's only good for dermatophytes. It will not work for any other fungal organism. Topical therapy. Clipping is an important part of therapy because you don't want to have all these arthrospores being released in the environment. And then you do topical therapy. You can use the lime sulfur, which is lime dip, or the myconazole or ketoconazole products. Let's move to a different category, the autoimmune diseases. The list is extensive. And really, tansigus is probably the most important thing for you to know, and especially tansigus foliaceus because it's the most commonly reported autoimmune diseases in dogs. Um, lupus, I guess you could see lupus, the discoid lupus uh, on the nose, and then systemic lupus is covered in somewhere else. Tantigus is um, type 2 hypersensitivity, which is cytotoxic, and the target of the immune response is the desmoglane. Um, desmoglane is a protein are actually a group of proteins that are responsible for intercellular adhesion. So if that is attacked, it means that all the epidermal cells become loose. They lose connection with each other. And so you have what is called acantholysis, which means the skin starts falling apart. Uh, Pantigus foliaceus is the most common in animals. In people, Pantigus vulgaris is the most common. And the acantholysis is subcornea, which is actually fairly superficial. So it's right below the stratum cornea. It starts on the face and then it spreads on the rest of the body. You may have nasal defragmentation and crusty feet, which is called hyperkeratosis. This is a dog with PF. Um, has it on the face. You can see definitely that has a lot of crafting. I guess initially these were pustules and then they dried up and they turned into crusts. And you have it here on the ears and obviously it's generalized. At this stage the disease is actually uh, quite severe. And uh, here on this foot um, you have, actually you don't see it very well, but this dog had uh, pustules and then they would dry up and you would have crusts. Actually here you might be able to see it here better. 
diagnosis, you can do psychology and you're looking for these cells, the cancellitic cells. And, or you can take a biopsy and you could do a histopathology. Or you could be looking for the deposition of antibodies in the skin. And that's why um, we do direct immunofluorescence or immunohistochemistry. And this is how um, our cancellitic cells look like. Actually, these are like, um, this one is more like a keratinocyte. It's dead. It's fairly large and um, uh, it's pale blue. This ones are a bit smaller and darker blue. I have a better picture where exactly how an acantolytic cell is supposed to look like. They're round and uh, they're smaller than a regular keratinocyte. They have lost connection with each other and so they become round. Perfidus erythematosus is limited to the face and is a benign form of PF. Pancigus vulgaris is what people get most commonly. Uh, fortunately for us, it's very rare in dogs. This is a much deeper disease, and uh, so the clinically it's an ulcerative disease. So you don't see crust, you see ulcers. It's poorly responsive to treatment, and so prognosis is uh, bad. Now, Treatment, um, basically what we do is we use high doses of steroids, immunosuppressive doses, and we combine it with another immunosuppressive agent. So you could use azathioprine, which is emurin, which should never be used in cats because it's very toxic for cats. Um, you can use chlorambucil or you can use gulp salt. Now in dogs, my first choice would be azathioprine, and if that doesn't work, I guess you can go down the list. The gold salts are only injectable, and they have a high incidence of drug eruptions, so that would be my uh, last choice. And then you have other diseases. They're not autoimmune, but immune-mediated. And I picked two because those are quite common, and you might have questions on that. One is erythema multiforme, and the other one is toxic epidermal necrolysis. Erythema multiforme is, um, the, the name itself is not a diagnosis, it's a description of a syndrome. And then the underlying uh, cause could be multiple. So it could be erythema multiforme triggered by drugs, it could be erythema multiforme triggered by neoplasia. Those are the two most common situations. And uh, clinically, you have what they call target lesions which means it's a round red lesion with a clear center. I have a picture to show you. And then you can have ulcers in your cavity. You can have nasal depigmentation. Now, this is a typical target lesion. So here you have this dog has uh, this uh, ring of redness, and then you have a clear center. That's very typical. That's how a receiver multiforme looks like. This one is more severe. I mean, you still have this round lesions, but they're like a borderline ulcerative, but still extremely round. Everything is round. So that's, this one, you can see it has a clear center. Um, that's typical erythema multiforme. How you diagnose it? You have to take a biopsy and submit it for histopathology, and the treatment really is to figure out the underlying cause. Uh, you can do supportive treatment, get fluids, treat the secondary infection, but you need to figure out that if there's a drug in use, you definitely have to discontinue the drug. If it's an underlying neoplasia, I guess it depends what kind of neoplasia it is. Toxic epidermal necrolysis is the next step. Uh, is everything is very similar to erythema multiform as far as the underlying cause but it's a much more severe, aggressive disease. So you have very rapid um, skin necrosis and slapping. And um, so prognosis is actually bad. Even in human medicine, the mortality rate is between 80 and 90 percent. And the reason is because it's very aggressive and it's very rapid. So they start by slapping extensive areas on the body. This dog just start and basically you can just peel off the skin. Then as far as the 
next group of diseases, endocrine diseases. That's the last, um, actually not the last group. We still have to talk about aneuplasia. But it's a very important group of diseases, and you might definitely get questions on that. Um, hypothyroidism is the most common uh, in Cushing. And then the other two, alopecia X and sex hormone, they're not nearly as common, uh, but alopecia X has triggered a lot of interest, and so that's why I, I put it on the list. Hypothyroidism is usually large breed dogs. You may have systemic and cutaneous signs. I focused on the cutaneous one. And uh, basically you have usually truncal alopecia or a poor hair growth. So if I clip the dog, then the hair doesn't grow back. And you have comedones like blackheads and the rat tail, which means a tail that is all alopecia, but the animal is not itchy on the tail, so that's different from flea allergy. You have seborrhea, uh, which is scaly skin, and you have secondary skin and ear infection. Also, they develop myxedema, and if you get on the face, you get that thick, uh, puffy appearance of the skin and droopy eyelids. It's called tragic face, and the dog looks like it's sad. And it's because it has mixed edema in the skin. So this is a dog with hypothyroidism. You see this, his facial expression. It's like he's is depressed. Um, and uh, also had a secondary infection on his feet, has swollen toes, had decreased activity level. And then this is what we call rat tail. So it's a bald tail, but the animal is not itchy. It's not chewing the hair. It's just completely bald. Diagnosis, um, there are some things that you can find on CBCM chemistry to support your diagnosis of hypothyroidism. You may have uh, anemia. You may have high cholesterol and high triglycerides. And then we do uh, what we call thyroid panel, and we look for free T4, total T4, and TSH. And the typical dog with hypothyroidism would have a low free T4, a low total T4, and a high TSH. So that would be the ideal situation. Obviously, not every dog fits in this category, but that's what you're aiming for. Then pushing, um, most of the time is pituitary. Um, it's usually small dogs, and they have PUPD, which is poly, uh, polyuria polydipsia. So they drink a lot, they urinate a lot, and they're very hungry, polyphagia. And they paint, they have a very uh, rapid uh, respiration rate. Skin wise, you have again, um, truncal alopecia, seborrhea, the comedones, they got secondary infections, and uh, again, they might get demodex. And the calcinosis cutis, which is something that is very specific of Cushing and dogs. So other species of Cushing, they don't develop calcinosis cutis. So that's a specific thing for dogs. And this is a typical Cushinoid dog with a big pot belly, has truncal alopecia, has uh, uh, macules of hyperpigmentation, and has a bit of papules. Um, here you have a beginning of calcinosis cutis. So if you feel it on the dog, it feels hard. Might have a clear center, and then it's red around it, and it's very, very itchy. So if you have one day in practice a dog and you've given a shot of steroids and the dog is not only um, uh, not improving but is actually getting worse, it's getting more and more itchy, you have to consider the possibility of calcinosis cutis. And they may get to start with little papules and then big plaques, a very itchy disease. And then this is a, just a general dis picture with an endocrine alopecia, um, you have a bit of hyperpigmentation, but there's no infection going on in the skin. Diagnosis, you can do, again, you can do CBC and chemistry. Uh, you may have high um, alphos, uh, you may have high liver enzymes, um, high cholesterol, you may see anemia, and then you can do a CTH too. And uh, it's 85% sensitive, which means that 15% of dogs with pushing will have a normal CTH. Or you can do low-dose dexamethasone suppression test, which is roughly 95% sensitive. 
So you still have 5% of dogs that could have a normal test and still have the disease. Alopecia X has a lot of different names. Uh, it's also been called pseudocushion. And what it is truly is a, an adrenal sex hormone imbalance. Most of these dogs have high progesterone and low testosterone. But these dogs never develop pushing. It's just a cosmetic disease. It's just became a science. They will never progress to have any systemic disease. And that's why uh, I usually don't treat them. And because otherwise the treatment would be lysodrin, which is the same treatment you use for pushing, which has severe side effects. But in this case, this is just a cosmetic disease. They just lose their hair and they got pigmented skin. But they, they're not PUPD, they don't get infections, and they're happy, healthy dogs otherwise. And diagnosis, there's one place in the United States, in Tennessee, where you can submit your blood sample to look for sex hormones before and after a CTH stimulation. And that's how we make a diagnosis. As far as metabolic diseases, there's one that's really important in dogs, and it's called, has a lot of different names. It's called hepatocutaneous syndrome or a necrolytic migratory erythema, superficial necrolytic dermatitis. has a lot of different names, but basically it's always the same disease. And it's um, diseases related to either liver problems or pancreatic problems. And dogs develop uh, ulcers, uh, which could be in their mouth or on their skin, and they can develop um, thick um, pads. And basically, nobody exactly knows how it works, but it seems that if you have either an internal disease which affects the liver or your pancreas, you may have amino acid deficiencies, and that affects the composition of the skin. And that's why for treatment, they tend to give amino acid supplementation, egg yolks, zinc, fatty acids. It's all nutritional therapy. So clinically, again, you have this ulcerative disease. Some typical areas is the commissure of the mouth, and then elbows, hocks, and tip of the ears. Um, and I have some pictures here. So again, you have this ulceration. These are older dogs, so they have some kind of internal disease going on. And uh, they may even have diabetes, and they develop these ulcers. They may have nasal depigmentation at times, and they develop ulcers on their feet. They get really lame. They refuse to walk. And again, the treatment is uh, nutritional treatment. And then the cutaneous lymphoma is something that uh, most of the time is, is missed. This is a lymphoma. It's different from the one that um, affects the lymph nodes and is addressed in internal medicine. This is one that is limited to the skin. It doesn't go anywhere else, um, usually the mouth or the skin. Uh, it's a T-cell lymphoma, and the, the bad news is that it does not respond to chemotherapy. In some dogs, may be a very slow disease. In other dogs, it's fairly rapid. And basically, clinically, it can go from sudden paritis in the northern dog to scaling, to ulcers, nodules, plaques, depigmentation. So if I have an older dog, I always look in their mouth. Um, if they have any sign of gingivitis or of depigmentation of the lips, uh, of the oral cavity, that's something that is always very suspicious. And uh, this is a more uh, progressed disease. I mean, this is way beyond the uh, mild clinical signs. This is just a, a severely ulcerative disease. So if I see a dog like this, I have to think, well, it could be toxic epidermal necrolysis. It could be hepatocutaneous syndrome. It could be uh, cutaneous lymphoma. That would be a top three differential diagnosis. And this one was actually a more scaling in presentation, it's hard to see from this picture, but basically the dog was a 10-year-old dog, never had any skin problems, suddenly turned uh, sibleric, and it turned itchy. So you take a biopsy to make a diagnosis, and that's basically histopathology. And you look lymphocytes, uh, look for lymphocytes in the epidermis. Here, toward the end, I put a list, which I think it might be useful for you, 
of differential diagnosis depending what lesions you see. So if you have a dog that has papules, which is red bumps, then definitely you have to think of folliculitis, pyderma being with dermatophytes, or you could have compound allergy, especially if it's ventral distribution. You could have flea allergy if it's on the rump and tail. You could have scabies if it's, again, ventral, um, elbows and hocks. But you can have pentagus, especially if it starts on the face. So that should be your list of differential diagnosis. If you have nasal defragmentation, you can think of uh, discoid lupus or opacitous type of disease, or you can have erythema multiforme. You can have mycosis fungoides, which is the cutaneous lymphoma we just talked about, or you can have a contact dermatitis, especially to plastic. Uh, there is an ingredient in plastic that kills melanocytes, and so you have defragmentation. If you have our ulcers, you can have erythema multiforme. You can have anemia, you can have lymphoma, or pemphigus vulgaris. But pemphigus vulgaris is very rare in dogs. This is what I have for you. Uh, I wish you best of luck. Um, there are several books that you can um, uh, read if you want more information. Uh, there's a small animal dermatology, uh, Merler, Turk, um, and Scott. Um, there is a uh, small animal derm, the arthrotherapy, which is uh, a Quachka and McDonald. And there is a large animal dermatology book from Scott, uh, which might be difficult for you to find. It's been out of print for a long time. Um, those are the most commonly used books. And um, there will be a question and answer sessions. And uh, I wish you best of luck for boards.